Judy, what time is it? Ten minutes after the last time you asked. Oh, right. <laughs> is it time now? Are we nearly ready now? Oh, for goodness sake, settle down. But it is, isn't it? It's nearly time again, isn't oh, it? Oh, really, Richard? Come on, please. Come on, we can do it now, can't we? Come on, I've been waiting so long oh, for this. Please, for please, please, oh. please, 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 please. OK, please, please, please. come on then. Let's do it. Right, ready? I'm ready. Here we go. So good to have you back with us on the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. We've missed you. Welcome to the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. So then, you want a story and I'll tell you one, but just the one. Don't either one of you ask me for more. Listen, both of you, listen well. You know, Judy, sometimes I just love this job. And don't interrupt. Khaled Hosseini and the mountains echoed. Once upon a time, in the days when divs and jinns and giants roamed the land, there lived a farmer named Baba Ayub. He lived with his family in a little village by the name of Maidan Sabs. Because he had a large family to feed, Baba Ayub saw his days consumed by hard work. Every day he labored from dawn to sundown, plowing his field and turning the soil and tending to his meager pistachio trees. At any given moment, you could spot him in his field, bent at the waist, back as curved as a scythe he swung all day. His hands were always calloused and they often bled, and every night sleep stole him away no sooner than his cheek met the pillow. We're back, and we're bringing eight more recommended reads from the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. As always, we hope that we've got something for everyone in this season's collection. The actual writing part is always a struggle. <laughs> writing is the hardest job I've ever done. I try to avoid going into the office as much as possible. Writing is quite a challenge. I mean, it's pathetic because I just sit there and make up stories, right? It's not, you know, saving the world. You know, I clean the swimming pool, look after the plants, do all of that. Finally, I have to go in there and I sit there and I do it until I'm too tired to go on. There are days when I feel like I have said exactly what I wanted to say, but those days are rare. Any writer will tell you it's tough. It's not an easy road to travel. I think every novel is a sort of cross-country race and halfway through you sort of wonder if you're ever going to get to the end. Oh, it's a contrary beast, I think. I'm sure there's a lot of psychological experimentation to be done on writers. And first, we start with a beautiful book by Khaled Hosseini. And why not let him describe it to us? Well, I would describe the book as a novel told in a series of more or less freestanding vignettes, each told from the viewpoint of a different character, with each chapter illuminating something that happened before and setting up their next story. All of them together uh, tell one big giant story. So it's almost the novel is composed almost as a mosaic. Uh, and it's a bit like listening to a choir, but one voice at a time. My intention always was to write a, a novel, but a, a novel with a shape a bit like a tree. There's a trunk with a central story and a series of branches that sprout from that one central narrative. Now, we both remember, Khaled, that after you wrote A Thousand Splendid Sons, you told us that in the final draft, the principal character's dialogue eventually came not from you, but from them, and that they kind of told you what they wanted to say. It sounded like a beautiful, I don't know, almost mystical writing process. Did you have a similar experience writing this book? Uh, very much. In fact, that's something that I hope happens with every book. Um, invariably, when I begin writing my books, in the first draft, uh, I don't know my characters very well. So I tend to be sort of the voice on the page. And what happens with subsequent drafts, I, my characters reveal themselves to me more and more. And I know their nuances. I know their subtleties. And I know their quirks and, and personality so much better that gradually my voice disappears from the page and they begin to speak for themselves. And very often... Uh, the, by by the fact that they've revealed themselves to me, they end up dictating their own fates. So it's not just a matter of writing the characters better. It often actually affects the plot. 
Um, and, uh, and, and I, and I know that the book is really taken off when that, when that moment happens, when I begin to hear the voices of the characters rather than my own. Family always plays a big part in your work. How important are they to you? And do your characters feel like family to you? Well, they feel like family to me. I've, I've, you know, I spend two or three years with them. So I, they feel like they're very much an organic part of me, but family is not something that I set out to write about. And I've written about it three times now in all three books. I would say they're all family stories, but it's something that I naturally gravitate toward. And I think partly it's because of my upbringing in Afghanistan, where um, your family is so central to your identity. It's uh, so crucial to how you understand yourself, your environment, the world you live in. Um, and so when I begin to write a character, I find myself at one point or another wondering who this character's father is and his or her mother and his or her brothers and sisters and cousins. And, and soon enough, what, a, what it, it becomes kind of family begins in, encroaching on the narrative. And soon I realize that I'm, I'm writing a, a story about family. And so my books often are multi-generational family stories. Um, it's difficult for me to write characters who are isolated apart from any kind of family structure, partly because of the way I was raised, the way I understand myself. Let's talk about stories within the story. You know, Are these perhaps influenced by the oral tradition of storytelling when you were a kid? Well, the novel begins with a folktale, which, which I created, but the, the folktale is told very much in the vein of stories that I heard growing up. There was a very rich oral uh, storytelling tradition in Afghanistan, and there still is. I was certainly raised around some very, very good storytellers. My grandmother, foremost among them, she told me stories of her own childhood at bedtime, and and frequently the folktales had these mythical creatures like divs and jinns and giants and so on. And so I, those are some of my earliest influences as a storyteller, those stories that I heard. And so I wanted to, in part, uh, pay homage to that by beginning this book with my own twist on this folktale, because although the folktale begins like a classic folktale, it takes a weird turn and it ends up being, I think, a little bit more... Uh, complex um, and more messy, I would say, than the folktales that I heard growing up. So it's, it's, it's a classic folktale, but my own, with my own spin on it. I think this is a kind of double-edged question, uh, Carly, but, but what are the psychological pressures of writing a third novel when the first two have been such massive successes? Well, the psychological pressure has little to do with um, expectations from public or from publisher book sales, bestseller lists, and so on and so forth, which a, a person might think that's really the, the pressure. The pressure f for, for writers, and, and, and I've heard this from many other writers that I've spoken to, the pressure is, is whether you still have something meaningful to say. Um, I never take it for granted that when I sit down that anything of any value is going to come out. There's a sense in me that there's a limited number of things that I have to say and at that some point, I will have said them all. And then at that point, I will be doing either one of two things, uh, saying rubbish or merely repeating myself, neither one of which I want to do. So the agony, uh, not the agony, but the sort of the, the, the angst of the writer is, uh, and the psychological pressure, as you put it, is to be able to continue to do something you love in the way that you want to do it. Uh, the pressure is entirely internal. People do say that in you, Afghanistan has at last found a voice. Was it ever your intention to step up to that particular plate? I, I have to be honest and say no. Um, I've, I've always written books with a very selfish motivation, which is that there is a particular dilemma with this given set of characters that I'm compelled to explore. Um, and, and, and there's something that speaks to me urgently, and it always has to do with a given character and a given story setting. Uh, the fact is that, that those characters that I've explored have been Afghan and they've lived in rather turbulent times in uh, recent Afghan history. And so the, their lives are greatly impacted by what's happened in Afghanistan over the last three decades. And so my books have become, uh, aside from, uh, the stories of these particular characters, have also kind of become 
chronicles of what's happened to that country uh, for 30 plus years. But I can't say in all honesty that I sat down with the intention of, of either illuminating the culture of Afghanistan or educating Western readers about life in Afghanistan. I feel uh, that's far too heavy and uh, onerous a burden for any novelist. Okay, the obvious one. What are you working on now? Well, I'm, I'm in the early stages of working on something. Um, I never know, I never take it for granted that it's going to go anywhere. Um, at some point, I will know that whether it's going to be a book or whether I need to start over. I'm not quite at that stage, but I am hopeful. I like this book from the off, you know, um, partly because he starts with a fable. When I first read it, I thought he was repeating a genuine fable from Afghanistan, maybe dating back two, three, four, five thousand years. But actually, he's made it up. It's an adaptation of a sort of a common fable of an ogre coming in and taking a child. Yeah, it's very much a folk tale, isn't it? It's a kind of folk tale which I would have thought isn't just common to Afghanistan, the Middle East, whatever. Hmm. It, it's common to all cultures um, hmm. to have that kind of fabled... What it does is it sums up humanity hmm. in a very particular, strong, mystical way. Hmm. I also loved about this book the fact that really it's a series of short stories. Yeah. They're all very, very cleverly interlinked. But actually, it's, it's, it's a book, it's like a box of chocolates, actually. Yeah. Um, they're on a kind of a theme, but each chocolate tastes different, you know? And I just, I just like the way he did that, and yet you never felt that there was any disassociation between one chapter and the next. They all kind of bleed in into the next one. I'd say, you know, I, we always have favourites, super favourites, and this is one of my favourite books in recent years. Mm. I think it's beautifully written. I mean, really beautifully, hauntingly beautifully written. He's got such a talent. He has, but I always think the best thing about Khaled Hosseini is the way he presents Afghanistan to people like us who mm. only are ever aware of Afghanistan mm. because we're watching the news, and it's absolutely horrendous and terrible things are happening there yeah. and actually he tells us about the people who live there and he makes us feel close to them he makes them he makes us feel that they're just like us they have exactly yep. the same concerns yep. and sadnesses and happinesses and families and all the rest of it he brings afghanistan to us and he presents it in a theater which is not just about war yes. and killing. And he presents it as a very cultured society. Mm -hmm. Extremely cultured, very layered, very old, very ancient, very traditional, and at the same time extremely sophisticated. As you say, we see Afghanistan in very black and white terms, and, and quite brutal terms really. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't ever really think of its culture as being much more than actually quite violent, mm -hmm. um, and historically violent. But it's got a whole different side, mm -hmm. a very gentle side, um, almost a biblical side, you know. Um, and the happy side. Oh, well, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, which, is what, which makes the tragedy of what Afghanistan has been going through in recent decades so much worse, because these are decent people. Mm -hmm. Decent, clever, wise people. Um, anyway, for my money, one of the best reads we've recommended in years. I kind of have a specific writing routine, which is that I sit down around 8.30, 9 o'clock, and I write till about 2.30 or so. I work from a, a small office in my own house, and I work on a computer. Uh, I work in silence. In other words, uh, you know, I can't have background music and that sort of thing, which I find very distracting. I drink a lot of coffee as I write. I don't plan anything out. I don't have outlines. I never know where my story is going. Um, and it's a, it all just kind of, kind of happens spontaneously at the keyboard. And uh, very often as I'm writing, I find that uh, my story is heading in a direction that is completely uh, a surprise to me. I have yet to speak to a writer in the last uh, 12, 13 years uh, who has told me that they made a conscious decision to write. Every writer I've ever met has had the drive for as long as they can remember. It feels like a compulsion, and it feels um, like they're in their, in their element the most when they're writing, when they're surrendering to that compulsion. It feels the most natural thing to them. And so for me, there was never any conscious decision to actually write. It was more an act of, of uh, satisfying this, this, this great desire that I had. The actual writing part is always a struggle. 
but there are days when I feel like I have said exactly what I wanted to say in the exactly in this in, 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 in the way that the thought had formed itself in my head and I was able to clearly translate that thought. But those days are rare. And uh, so most of writing is a struggle to have as many days like those as possible. But I, it's something that I have loved my entire life. I cannot recall a time in my existence that I didn't love the act of writing, the act of creating characters and story. Uh, I just feel very blessed to be able to, uh, to, be able to do it and to have uh, uh, people who are interested in, in what I write. The feeling that I had when I finished And the Mountains Echoed was the one, the same one that I had when I finished the previous two books, which was tremendous relief. Uh, there's no guarantee that, uh, that when you undertake a novel that you'll actually be able to guide it to its completion. Uh, it may just die at some point. And so to see when I, when I was nearing the end, to see that there was, in fact, the, the circle was going to close and I was able to bring it to its conclusion, which to me felt truthful and satisfactory, was, was a, a great relief. Uh, and when I printed those pages uh, and showed them to my kids, uh, it, it, it just felt like a huge uh, weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Now, next time, we'll be talking all about a man who'd rather we didn't know he exists. Identify yourself, the Marine Signalman repeated. My name is Scott, but I knew that was the wrong thing to say. A name would mean nothing. Standing in the pounding sun, my eyes aching, I felt myself drift from my body. As if from on high, I looked down on myself. It's an action-packed, globe-trotting race against time. Don't miss the next Richard and Judy Book Club podcast, exclusive to WH Smith. Digging deeper on the download with WH Smith. I can't wait. No, really, I cannot wait. How long now, Judy? How long have we got? How much longer do I have to wait now? Oh, no. Here we go again. No, but seriously, we could just keep going. I'm ready. You're ready. We're all ready. We've got more than enough books to get through. And we could do that thing that we always talk about.